I hope you're already having a good morning and we hope that you enjoyed today's session. Today we'll be looking at securing your digital landscape. This webinar is going to be the first of a series that we are going to have on cybersecurity. My name is Rosemary Yono, Assistant Integration Consultant at Pessel Systems Limited, and I'll be your host for today. Pessel Systems is an IT firm that offers custom software development, systems integration expertise, and experts for training and consulting services for business. And we're doing this for the past 27 years. As stated earlier, we'll be looking at securing your digital landscape. In recent times, we've realized that businesses are transitioning. Even some have transitioned into a more digital space where there are interconnected business systems, where there's migration of applications and data into the cloud, and also where there's a heavy media, social media presence. And in as much as we are enjoying these you know, technologies that we have, it also poses new security threats, and which is why we are having today's webinar. Today, we are privileged to have presenting to us two experts. We'll have um, Alfred McPhilip Mante, a systems administrator at Personal Systems Limited, and also have a hacker in our midst, Mr. Kojo Amwakon, who will be taking us through today's presentation. As the presentations are going on, if you have any questions, kindly feel free to use the Q&A session. You can type in the questions there. Uh, after the presentations, you're going to give 10 minutes for, to answer these questions that you have. If you'd like to use your audio, that is also fine. Kindly raise your hand so that we can unmute you to ask your questions. And that's going to be 10 minutes after both presentations. So without wasting much time, we'd like to invite our first speaker, Alfred McPhilip Monte. As mentioned earlier, he's a systems administrator, a certified SOFOS technician, a SOFOS administrator as well, to give us a brief introduction as to uh, cyber security issues or securing a digital landscape. Please do enjoy the session and hope you have key takeaways from this. Thank you. Welcome once again, and what should you expect? Welcome once again, and what should you expect for today's session? We'll be giving a brief but high-level overview of the digital of the digital landscape, what cybersecurity is, the threats, as well as some tips to secure the ever-evolving digital ecosystem. Now, globally, businesses have seen significant changes in business environments where there's been a move from working in silos and have transitioned into a more digital ecosystem or landscape where the new reality is one of interconnected IT resources that can function as a unit. Now we're looking at interconnected business systems, interconnected supply chains, cloud computing, as well as remote working, especially because of COVID-19. Now here's the reality. No single business can provide all the needs of its customers, hence the need for interconnected or hybrid systems. Now, IoT has also improved the efficiency of work by introducing industrial control systems, including devices and network capability that allows businesses and by using robots and controllers to operate efficiently. Now, all these interconnections generate huge amounts of data that can be exploited. And here's, a, here's an interesting fact. Retail banking has actually been using an early prototype of IoT devices for decades. The automated teller machine, properly referred to as the ATM. Now, ATMs have been one of the top IoT devices that make banks far more efficient by allowing real-time transactions rather than waiting to see a teller. And even now, a lot of banks allow you to make deposits at the ATM. Work that hitherto would have taken days can now be done in a matter of hours. We've even made payment systems easier with inter interoperability of payment platforms, use of Bitcoin and all other cryptocurrencies in circulation now. 
By embracing digitalization, banks can provide enhanced customer services. Thus, today people have round the clock access to their bank accounts due to online banking. Now, it's safe to say that we love our smart devices. As individuals, we love how they make our lives more convenient and fun. I mean, one click connects the world in your palm. You can get information in real time. For example, checking the status of an online transaction, tracking the delivery of a package, checking inventories, and so many others. We even access corporate documents on our, on our smart, smart devices and send emails from them. It's made it easier to stay in touch with each other. Digitalization has become an essential part of our daily lives. It's made it easier to stay in touch with people who are in far countries just at the click of, of a button. Unfortunately, there's a catch. This digital landscape presents new security challenges. It has increased the attack surfaces, the attack surface that hackers can exploit. And a common misconception is that cyber attacks occur only on systems and laptops, but there's been a very significant increase in hacks on personal devices and smart devices. A good example is the rampant hacking of WhatsApp accounts. Now, this digital landscape is one that is constantly evolving and to have the nature of the attacks in recent years. Thus, traditional security approaches are just not enough. Now, to better understand how to secure this digital landscape, we need to understand what cybersecurity is. In simple terms, cybersecurity is a practice of securing systems, networks, and data from digital attacks. Now, Cybersecurity has three main pillars, which we call the CIA triad. And the CIA triad is an information security model. Each component represents a fundamental objective of information security. And unfortunately, if we lose one of these, that becomes a vulnerability that an attacker can exploit. Now let's take confidentiality. It ensures that information has not been disclosed to unauthorized people. Let's say you have a document you wanted to make sure that nobody could read except for you. Ideally, how would you protect it? In the fiscal world, you would take it, put it in an envelope, seal it, and lock it in a safe, ensuring that only someone who has the key could read that file. In the digital world, we do something similar, but we would use things like a public or private key and encryption algorithms. Integrity ensures that information stays consistent so that the information is not modified or altered without proper authorization. Now let's use um, a bank balance as an example. If you have the right key, which in this case is your password or PIN to access your bank account, you can see the balance. Thus you pass the confidentiality test. But imagine if you could go in and make changes to your bank balance, then that would be a breach of integrity because data is being modified without the proper authorization. Only your bank should be able to do that. In the digital space, when we talk about integrity, um, a term that will be coming up a lot is hashes and cryptography. Now, availability is focused on ensuring that the information is able to be accessed, stored or protected at all times. Now, going back to the bank scenario, let's say you go to their website and you want to look at your bank, your bank balance. You have the right key, which is your password, and so you pass confidentiality. Your bank balance remains unchanged, unchanged as it was yesterday, and so that's good integrity. But what happens if you enter the website, example, bank.com, and you get a web page that's not available, which is shown by the 404 error? Well, that means you've lost availability. You can't access the data. So now, even though you are maintaining the first two principles of confidentiality and integrity, if there's no availability, then it becomes no use to you as a consumer. And that's why these three things are very important as they work together to provide us with usable systems. At this point, we looked at digital landscape. We've seen the shift in business environments to a more interconnected one, as well as the benefits that digitalization presents. And our second consultant will give us a better understanding of what exactly these threats are, as well as what we can do to mitigate them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfred Monte, for that exposure to what our digital systems are and the potential threat or risk that it poses. Our second presentation will be taken by a hacker, he at Fessel Systems Limited, what some know as a white hat hacker, others also know as a penetration tester, to come and tell us 
on what we need to do to mitigate these threats, the do's and the don'ts, and what are we doing. Please enjoy this session from him. Over to you, Mr. Kujamwa. Thank you. Great. So as my colleagues rightly mentioned, technology is doing a lot of good. However, it's also created a not so new type of threats called cyber threats. Now these threats are stemmed from weaknesses and loopholes inherent in these technologies. In fact, it is said that the only way to stay unhackable is to detach your device from its power source, shut it down, and then bury it in the sand, which implies that no technology is foolproof. About a decade or two ago, it was hard for nations and organizations to appreciate the extent to which a cyber threat or attack could disrupt their daily operations. And so they put in little to no effort in securing themselves. This perception is changing and is changing fast due to a number of publications on high profile attacks on power grids, nuclear power plants, banks, you name it. Now Ghana has also had its fair share of these attacks. In 2020, for example, the Bank of Ghana reported that the industry lost about a billion Ghana cities. That's compared to 115 million Ghana cities in the previous year. And so we are going to look at some of these threats and how they are leveraged by threat actors to do what they do. Now, usually a person's first um, encounter with a cyber threat is with a computer virus. And computer viruses are basically programs written for malicious intent. It's however, one of a variety of its kind called malware. Now under malware, we have spyware, adware, worms, Trojan horses, and so on and so forth. But these operate in their own unique ways. Some of them can be embedded in files and other legitimate applications and others can actually mutate, just as we had COVID-19 mutating to other variants like Omicron and, and whatnot. This makes it pretty hard for antiviruses and threat detection systems to, I mean, detect them and then stop them in their tracks. Now, unknown to so many people, cyber threats are not always technical. In fact, some of the most lethal attacks we've had in recent years were not so technical. Threat actors basically use their interpersonal skills to convince their victims to give them credentials and another sensitive data by purporting to be who they weren't. And so a threat actor could act as though he was your systems administrator or your CEO. But you, ask, you say that, oh, I recognize my systems administrator's voice or my CEO's voice, or that would be a bit hard for a, ha a hacker to do such a thing. But fortunately or unfortunately, we have technology like uh, voice changing technologies and then the new one called Deepfake. Deepfake is able to impersonate your, your voice, your, your gestures, and even your whole outlook, making it extremely easy for hackers to, to uh, impersonate you. Now, about a month ago, a hacking group called Lapses made headlines when they attacked a cybersecurity company called Okata. Now, Okata provides identity and access management for companies like Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Samsung, you know, the big shots. The hackers leveraged their initial foothold with Okata to get into these accounts of these big names I, I just mentioned. Now, mind you, these hackers were between the ages of 16 and 21. And they, it's said that the ringleader of this, of this group is, is the 16 year old. Now this demonstrates how even the biggest names in the industry can fall, to, can fall victim to social engineering. Oh, and by the way, in our part of the world, social engineering is what we call, we call 419, right? Now, we've uh, already talked about how hackers are able to embed, uh, embed malicious code into legitimate software. This is quite effective because it allows hackers to leverage the permissions and trusts of leg given to legitimate software and services. And so obviously your antivirus is not going to stop 
uh, Microsoft's word from working, right? Because it's a legitimate software. If hackers are able to embed their malicious code into such a software, obviously this virus or malware will be given the leeway to move laterally or vertically within your network. Now, a typical example is one of the biggest hacks that happened last year and it was against a, a company called Cassia. Now, Cassia provides remote management and, and monitoring for managed IT services, um, managed IT service providers, right? And so using their, their initial foothold in Cassia, hackers were able to penetrate some of the biggest uh, companies in the world, right? And then they, they did this by triggering an update in the Cassia software. And then using that update, they were able to implant malware in so many um, computers all around the world. We all love having access to free things. And our, for most of us, uh, we love having access to free Wi-Fi. But not all of these are exactly free, right? Most of these wireless access points do not encrypt data. And even if they do, they use very weak encryption technologies. And so it makes it very easy for hackers to intercept data and transit and read them in clear text. That's if there's no encryption on it, or even if there's encryption on it to unencrypt the data that is in transit. So take, for example, you are entering your login details for your bank account, right? A hacker being able to intercept the data in transit could see your login credentials in clear text. Another very popular uh, kind of attack is uh, denial of service. And it's basically a hacker launching um, an attack that kind of floods your, your resources. And by resources, I mean, Take, for example, a, a website is usually hosted on, on, on a server, right? And probably that server is supposed to receive 100 visits simultaneously. Now, a hacker could flood the server with about 1,000 or a million visits, which will ultimately where the resources used to provide the service, which could be the website down. We often see this kind of attacks against government websites these days. Now, most websites and applications have input fields. And by input fields, I mean fields that enable you to enter maybe any form of data. On Twitter, for example, it could be the field that enables you to enter your next tweet, right? Now, hackers are able to leverage this, the, the usage of these fields to input malicious codes. And these codes could be used to do any kind of thing, right? Um, in a recent pen test we did, we injected code that um, recorded keystrokes of visitors on, on the particular website. And so it could be any sensitive data whatsoever. As soon as it's entered, we get the data being entered on our servers in real time. Well, no one likes reading bulky documentations. I know I'm, not, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. But unfortunately, cybersecurity policies tend to fall under that category. The only few times that a lot of us read these uh, documentations are when um, they have to be reviewed for and uh, during auditing sessions or during a cybersecurity incident. Now, what that leads to is lapses in the implementation and configurations of software and hardware in, in most companies. Because basically, sub, uh, cybersecurity policies serve as a guide. And so you need to always review this, um, these guides to enable you implement the technology that you want to implement in your company the right way because most hackers are able to initiate their initial foothold or even gather data before penetrating into a company due to misconfigurations in the technologies that exist in their target uh, companies. Now, 
It said that about 78% of attacks on organizations come from insider threats. Some of these insiders may just be victims of social engineering attacks and others may be accomplices, right? And take for example, uh, uh, an AC repairer or mechanic coming into your company acting as if he's about to do a routine check on your, on your air conditioners. This, hacker, hack, uh, this AC mechanic could be paid to insert a pen drive into one of your computers. And this pen drive could initiate the launch of a ransomware attack in your company. And so it's very important to be vigilant because cybersecurity is a collective responsibility and not meant for one person or a particular team. We should be all in on this. Now the truth is antiviruses are basically playing catch up. Hackers are always ahead of the game. And I'm not saying this because I'm one, I'm saying this because it's a fact. And so it's always important to make sure that your antivirus is up to date because the best, your best bet at keeping yourself and your organization safe is by keeping your antivirus up to date. Also, you need to promptly report any signs of compromise on your, com on your machine. A typical example is logging into your machine and realizing that you have duplicates of a particular file files that you know you did not duplicate, right? It could also be that your machine is running a bit too slow. Immediately report such an incident to your systems administrator or your in-house security consultant. A lot of us think that um, we have backups, backups of our files and whatnot, or we may have a server somewhere that's um, that's keeping backups of our daily activities. But not all these backups are being done the right way. And so usually when a company gets hit by ransomware, their files and their backups get infected with malware. And so companies need to know the right way of backing up their systems so that in, in case they are hit by ransomware or any form of attack, they'll be able to get their businesses back on track. Because no matter how serious you may think your company is in ensuring that um, you are safe online, that attack would happen and you must be ready. Hackers take advantage of activities that are almost impossible to ignore. Take, for example, you starting your day and checking through your, your emails, reading your emails. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. It's your, it's your job. Now, some are, uh, the, 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 the thing is knowing that, a hacker knowing that he's going, you are going to read your email would obviously send an email with say malicious links and, and whatnot. And to the untrained eye, some of these mails would be extremely difficult to, I mean, to detect. Some companies rely on secure email gateways, but the truth is um, some of these emails are able to bypass these filters. And so it's very, very important that staff in a company get trained on how to detect these, these um, email addresses. It's fraudulent emails, right? And then email addresses. Usually I, I come across questionnaires on social media platforms. It could be people asking the general public what their favorite colors are. And it always amazes me how people fall for, for such tricks. Because if you'd remember the last time you registered yourself on a, on a platform, you were probably asked some personal questions like your favorite color, your mom's maiden name and things like that. And so putting such information out there for everyone to see could easily be leveraged by hackers to get into such platforms like your bank accounts and, and, and things like that. Now, people tend to download unauthorized software or free software from various platforms 
thinking that it could be their, their best way of escaping subscription charges. Well, it works, right? But these software and files could come embedded with malware. And we've already talked about how this malware can, can be used to cause harm to you and your network. So it's important to stay away from such free, so-called free items online. Now, a favorite trick amongst hackers is walking into a target company and then dropping external devices in certain vantage points, right? Knowing that people will definitely pick them up and out of curiosity would want to, I mean, insert them into their devices. Now, these, these pen drives happen to be riddled with uh, a lot of malware and stuff like that. And so hackers are able to use that to get initial foothold into uh, companies. It works all the time. Now, most gaming sites and adult sites are riddled with malware. And so it comes as no surprise that companies usually prevent their, their staff from having access to them. But we know one or two, two people in the company who try to use certain platforms to bypass these security controls. I'm here to tell you that you are going to cause harm to your company big time one of these days. Because like I just said, these platforms are riddled with malware. And so you may need to be very careful visiting these platforms, either with your personal devices or your work devices. Thank you so much for making time to listen to us. Um, Rosemary, come in. Thank you so much, Mr. Kojo Almako, for such insightful presentation. Wow, we, we, we have learned so much from, from this presentation. Um, if, if during the presentation you felt that probably your security systems need to be looked at, or you need to put together a more you know, comprehensive policy with regards to your security systems, please feel free to reach out to us for a free assessment, yes. This is not the kind of free code we were talking about, this is actually free. We are going to um, have a free assessment of your systems and what policies you need to be re-looked at again, reach out to us on uh, info at pesol.net, info at pesol.net, and if you feel free to reach out to us, and then uh, through our social media handles as well, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, the name is Pesol Systems Limited. You can also call us on the number, number that you have on your screen for uh, some form of engagement on, on, on these free assessments you are looking at having for you. So for now, we are going to take our questions and then our answers for 10 minutes. I have some questions here I'd like to read out. So whilst I'm reading out and it's being answered, if you have any more, please feel free to use a QA and a session part for that. And then if you'd like to speak as well, why not kindly raise your hand so that I can unmute you for you to have your time. So I'd like to go on to the first question by Hope Davis. Um, he says that, Taking Ghana's tech utilization and evolutions in place, what areas of cyber security should one focus to combat cyber threats? What areas of in cyber security should one focus on to combat cyber threats? So uh, my presentation presenters will be looking at that. So Alfred, can you please help us with that? Okay. Uh, that's that's a pretty good question. Um now here's, here's the unfortunate thing. Cybersecurity is actually very broad. And so if we if we were to give you a specific area, that would be very tough. But at the same time too, what um, we can start with is you should look at what area, let's say um, you are working in. So a good example is if you are a network admin, try and then start with something simple, secure your network, make sure that, make sure that your wireless access points the kind of encryption that you're using isn't um, open, isn't open, it isn't personal. You can go as far as using things like um, radius or TACAC service to ensure that you have even, and you have extra um, 
encryption, you have extra protection. And there's also this simple concept in cybersecurity called defense in depth. You cannot have just one level of security or protection. You should have multiple layers of security, multiple layers of, of encryption. Um, you can put in things like MFA or 2FA, where you have uh, multiple levels of authentication so that even if somebody has a pass, somebody is able to get your password, then you'd have another sort of um, authentication so that maybe a pin, maybe um, using your fingerprint, something of that sort to increase the amount of security that you can, um, you're, you're implementing. All right, Zemafe, thank you. I hope it it's answers your question, hope David. If you have any further questions, um, just feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media handles or info at PESO.net. We'll be glad to, to have time for you to, to answer that. Thank you. We have an, another uh, by, okay, you, are, you, you want to remain anonymous, that's, that's fine. Uh, do we have institutions or a place to report such malicious phishing mails or any hacking incidents. Do you have institutions or a place to report such malicious or phishing mails or any hacking incidents? Okay. We have um, Kojo taking that for us. Okay, so we so so the National Cyber Security Center, um, you, you might want to visit their website. That is, so I'm going to drop the link in the comment section. Um, it has a portal for you to report any incident whatsoever. And so to also add up to what my colleague Alfred said, uh, his take on how Ghana can, um, I mean, secure itself in this tech evolution. Okay, so I'm pers I personally see that we have a lot of websites coming up, right? Websites that provide certain services for, um, for various things. And so I personally think that government should engage white hat hackers or penetration testers to evaluate these systems. Because as my colleague said, I mean, you should do the necessary, right? You get several layers of protection and whatnot. But the truth is, as much as that helps, which it actually does, it kind of slows down a hacker's progress or the, a hacker's ease of breaching your system. A hacker will definitely find his way in there some way, somehow. And so, it's very important that in your assessment, in your development of such platforms, you engage hackers, good hackers or penetration testers so that you'd be ready when it's time to launch your systems. Outside, and I'm going to use the US as an example, they have what we call back bounty programs. And so with back bounty programs, governments open up several several of their platforms out there. So it could even be the Ministry of De Defense, the CIA's um, websites, the NSA's websites, and all these very important public portals for hackers to attempt to breach them, right? And so once they are breached, they, these hackers can report the, the vulnerabilities. And based on the severity of these vulnerabilities, they are given a, a payout. So if governments could, could also embrace this approach, I believe it would, it, it would help. Thank you very much, Kujo, for that um, as well. We have another um, by Hope Davis. It says, thanks for the healthy talks on security. Just as you are aware, security and the rate of attacks is on the rising. Please, what's your take or opinion on having a live demo where we get to see, learn what happens in the real world scenario? Perfect question, Hope David. This is the first of a series that we are going to have on cybersecurity. And just relax. We're going to have more in, in, in stock for you um, in our subsequent 
presentation. So please hold on to that as we have more. You can still feel free to reach out to us at infoatpesol.net and then we can have further conversations from there. But today we, we, we are not betting so much with a lot of information. We'll have that in our subsequent webinars. Thank you so much. Another question says, sir, can you elaborate about the SQL injection you used in your recent pen test? So I guess it's for a hacker here. So could you, can you elaborate about the SQL injection you used? Thank you. Okay. Right, so so it it was a login. I mean, it was a login um, page, right? And so this login page didn't have uh, what what we call enough input validation, right? And so I kind of I was able to find um, the the what's it called the data management system behind. That, that the application was running on. I was able to enumerate the folders, sorry, the tables, the columns and whatnot within that particular database. And I was able to go a step further to execute remote code within that particular database, using that particular database. And so um, SQL injection can not only help you to kind of enumerate the data that's within the data management system, but it could also aid you in uh, executing remote execution. This is quite interesting as well. Yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. So we would like to take some few audio questions from some of you, just one or two more, and then we'll call it a day. So I'm allowing Hope David to talk. He has his hand up. So kindly you mute so you can ask your question, Hope David. Okay, um, can you hear me, please? Yes, please, sure. I can. Thank you. All right, sure. Um, thank you so much for the presentations. And um, I just wanted to make some emphasis, like, you know, uh, and also, um, together with the pen tester, of, uh, his name again, I just he just gave me. I think he made a really good point. Yeah, Kujo, yeah, sure. So I think he really made a good point. Um, you know, mentioning that you know when you go out there, like you know, um, I've not been there, but I follow some of um, like um, some of them online, Twitter, Facebook, and you know, YouTube, and look at some of the dev conferences and some of the uh, back bounty programs that they have and they do to you know um kind of like revive and also to um, bring people into the community so i think what um we just said about that is very true and something is something that i think we should um, really embrace here in ghana by you know organizing um more like a demo and also uh, like a defcon you know where like a ctf programs where we have so many people you know coming like kind of like coming to the uh, tech industry, like you know, security side, to you know, um, test systems and also to develop passion for it. And um, I mean, that's just um, my take. I'm like kind of you know, add up to it. And secondly, also, I think um, also you know, um, the career aspirations for young ones who want to also enter into cybersecurity. Um, I think that's why I also asked the my my earlier question, um, which was I think incomplete. Um, concerning, you know, um, you know, Ghana's evolution, how, I mean, what areas should one major? And also, like, if we can also um, emphasize on maybe, okay, um, you are in the university, what are you studying now? You want to end, break into cybersecurity, what should you major more, I mean, like, um, what should you major um, much on to focus on um, security? Um, I think these are the two major um, areas I would like to um, talk about. All right, thank you so much, Hope David, for, for, for that. That is indeed true. And we'd like Alfred to speak briefly on that. Just a minute. Okay. So, um, Hope, in with regards to the areas, with regards to the areas, we'll be addressing that in some of our subsequent webinars. We'd have um, a webinar just for things like career goals, career opportunities, as well as um the areas that you can specialize in, places where we found vulnerabilities, and then how we went about um, remediating those ones as well. Sure, thank you so much. 
And um, I, th I know time is of essence here. You know, um, I, she, I mean, some someone made mention of um, asked a question of uh, you know where we can report um, vulnerabilities, and I think that was answered correctly. Um, I'd like to share some short, I mean, 30 seconds um, story. You know, I, I personally I work as a systems engineer, but I'm also you know uh, interested in security. So I did uh, previously. I did find some vulnerability in um, certain, you know, company, but like reporting it was an issue, and um, that brought my zeal for, you know, doing that kind of research and doing kind that kind of um, security findings and vulnerabilities. You know, that you know that brought me down. So I think um, addressing that part um, was really helpful, um, not only to the person asking the question, but also to me myself. You know, to also pick up the pace. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David, for sharing that and we, we, we share in your, in your experience that you are telling us. Um, if, can, can we have any more questions? If, if not, uh, we would like to wrap up. We would like to take much of your time. Whether there are any more questions. Okay. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, making time to join us on today's webinar. If you missed any of the parts or sessions, kindly go back to our social media platforms, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. We have the live recordings there. Kindly go there, listen to it again. If you have any more questions, as mentioned earlier, reach out at info at pessor.net and uh, phone numbers or those social media handles. We are launching another poll to um, kindly answer these questions for us so we get to know whether your expectations were met. It should take about a minute to be done with it. There are just four questions and it'll take just a minute to finish. Thank you so much. Okay, we have just a few more to finish. We'd like to take as many responses as we can as we prepare for the second webinar of the series. Thank you so much for answering the poll. I see a hand up, but unfortunately, we can't uh, take any more questions. Busy Brain, kindly reach out to us at infoatpesol.net or through our social media handles at Facebook, Twitter, and then um, YouTube, LinkedIn as well. If you, you can call us as well on the number, the number on your screen and on our uh, website, pesol.net. Thank you so much for joining us. And please do join us next month for our second webinar.